Good evening, I'm Ian Hanamansing. Tonight, early Serb applicants got bad advice from the government. I think there's a problem there. Uh, it needs to be addressed. Where does it leave the demand for repayments? We need a lockdown. I think that's the answer. Ontario gets set for new holiday measures. The challenge of allowing or not the tournament to go ahead, uh, that was a judgment call. Is Edmonton's World Junior Hockey Tournament on thinner ice? And trying to manufacture a market breakthrough. So when you think buy local, you don't think buy black local. A new vehicle for black-owned businesses. This is The National. The Prime Minister addressed Canadians today near the end of a brutal 2020, but Justin Trudeau says there is reason for hope in 2021. Just like through this spring, summer and fall, we will continue to be there for you. We will do as a government whatever it takes for as long as it takes to keep you safe and supported. But tonight, two stories raise questions about two key government support programs, questions about what happens when the rules aren't followed strictly, and questions about fairness between members of the public and private clubs. Let's start with Canada's emergency response benefit. Huge numbers of Canadians who received it are being told they shouldn't have, but many say they were wrongly encouraged to apply by a government agency, and tonight, the government seems to agree. Catherine Cullen explains. We're serious when we said we would be there for people. Again today, the Prime Minister tried to reassure hundreds of thousands of Canadians they don't have to pay back their pandemic benefits, at least not yet. We didn't uh, deliver support to millions of Canadians who needed it just to claw it back at Christmas. The Canada Revenue Agency has warned some people they might not have met the criteria for CERB and would have to repay. But now, a twist. At the beginning, when people were phoning, uh, unfortunately, there was a, a mistake made. He says for three weeks, CRA employees had incorrect instructions and gave applicants the wrong information about self-employment income. Well, obviously, uh, they, they probably relied on that and that they applied. And now they're being told that they, they might owe the money. So I think there's a problem there. Uh, it needs to be addressed. Very different from probably any work that you've done before. Tammy Seed runs a business giving holistic nutrition advice. She says when she first applied, she was given wrong information by two different CRA agents. The second person encouraged me to apply. In fact, using the word, mm. we encourage you to go ahead. I encourage you to go ahead and apply. Mm. This is what this program is for. You're the, the, the self-employed type of person that we're trying to support. Now she and her family could have to repay $14,000 in CERB. In a statement tonight, the CRA said, the Government of Canada acknowledges that communications on this topic were unclear in the first days after the CERB was launched. This includes both the CERB web pages and the information provided to call centre agents. We regret that this lack of consistent clarity led some self-employed individuals to mistakenly apply to the CERB despite being ineligible adding people will have time and flexibility to repay. As for the Prime Minister's encouragement... So I don't want this to be an extra stressor uh, on a Christmas that is already uh, not like others. The best comparison that I've been able to come up with is like telling someone that they're very ill to not worry about it. Seed says the Prime Minister can't tell people not to worry without giving them answers. Catherine Cullen, CBC News, Ottawa. And now to a story about Canada's emergency wage subsidy. It was set up to help businesses by supporting their payrolls. But if a company ends up doing better than expected, should it have to give the money back? It's a question being asked after a CBC News investigation learned a private golf club has banked a surplus. Jonathan Gatehouse has the details. I welcome you to join the club. The Royal Ottawa Golf Club promotes itself as one of the oldest, most prestigious clubs in Canada a playground for Ottawa's elite. When the pandemic hit, the club did what more than 350,000 other employers did. It applied for the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy to help cover the payroll, fearing COVID restrictions would make it hard to pay staff. Welcome to the, our 120th AGM. CBC News has obtained the club's audited financial statements and a recording of its recent annual general meeting the club treasurer telling members they're closing out the year with a big surplus, thanks in large part to the federal wage support. It was over a million dollars, and that ended up on the bottom line. We didn't know what 
the next year was going to bring to us. And so we decided just to, um, to park it in the uh, surplus. Turns out even with the clubhouse closed, the course was full all summer with socially distanced golfers and the club did far better than it expected. The spirit of Sue's is compensatory. It's to keep you whole under pandemic conditions. It's not uh, uh, intended to be a windfall. Club representatives declined our request for an interview, but emailed that the Sue's wage subsidy has given us the flexibility to survive this extremely challenging time. They pointed to a canceled Thanksgiving dinner as a substantial food loss that was absorbed by drawing down on our surplus. The notion that companies who got the subsidy might end up with a surplus may not be something Ottawa fully considered. Though Finance Minister Christian Freeland insisted recently, the intention of the money was always clear. The wage subsidy can, by very clear and specific design, only be used for to pay employees. That money cannot be used for any other purpose. A spokesperson for Freeland said that any employers who misuse the subsidy will have to pay it back, along with a 25% penalty on the amount claimed. As for Royal Ottawa, the club maintains it did initially need the money for payroll and is under no obligation now to give up its surplus. Jonathan Gatehouse, CBC News, Toronto. That story was part of our CBC News project, The Big Spend, a look at the federal government's $240 billion in pandemic relief. You can see all the numbers in our interactive feature at cbcnews.ca slash thebigspend. Ontario's in the midst of announcing new restrictions in some areas and extending others in the worst hit regions. And this comes as the daily count of new cases remains high. Today's tally exceeding 2,000 again. Since just Monday, the province has added more than 11,000 new cases. And yes, that's another record. Magda Gebersalasa begins with a woman who hopes no one goes through what she did. Beth Ann Keep carries the scars of COVID-19, physical and emotional. I was, had one foot in the grave and one foot out. In the spring, she was in a month-long coma. Months later, she still has breathing issues, numbness in her leg and a raspy voice. As cases continue to surge, she worries about others. I think the way our numbers are going, we need to lock down. I, I, think, I think that's the answer. Today marked the fourth day that new cases numbered more than 2,000. This while lockdowns in hotspots Toronto and Peel region were set to expire Monday. I can tell you they won't be expiring. We're going to continue on with uh, the, the lockdowns within those regions and we'll have additional information on Monday for the, the balance of the, the province. Ford says Hamilton will also go into lockdown Monday, bringing the total in the grey zone to five. Under current restrictions, that means closing gyms, banning dining at restaurants and no gathering with anyone outside your household. Hospitals are strained and doctors keep sounding the alarm. We're worried about a surge around Christmas or right after Christmas if people don't heed things. So I think uh, Premier Ford should, you know, hurry up and do a little bit more. Sources tell CBC News that the government is considering a lockdown across southern Ontario from Boxing Day until January 11th. It could be similar to what Quebec is doing. Their school will be taught online to begin the new year. This Toronto mom is bracing for what may be coming. Hopefully they tell us sooner rather than later and they don't wait until January 2nd to say, P.S. you're not going back to school. Still, she supports a shutdown to get the numbers down. And so does Beth Ann Keep. I wouldn't want anybody else to go through this. Whatever restrictions may come, she just hopes people start to take them seriously. And Magda, if Southern Ontario does go the way of Quebec, as sources have said, give us another example of a restriction that we might see on Monday. Well, take retail shops. Right now in Ontario's lockdown zones, they can still do curbside pickup and delivery. But if the plan is to do what Quebec is doing come Christmas time and, and right into January, well, those non-essential businesses will essentially be forced to close. Ian? Clearly a big change, Magda. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Police here in B.C. have fined representatives from three churches in the Fraser Valley a total of more than $18,000 for ignoring public health orders. 
Chilliwack RCMP says it followed up on complaints that the churches were holding in-person gatherings. Three people have been charged. By population, Alberta has the highest rate of newly reported COVID infections in the country, but there are some encouraging signs. The message from the province's top doctor, though, double down. We have seen COVID-19 cases level or dip before, only to rise again. The positive indicators we are seeing can be reversed in a matter of days if we all don't keep doing our part. Alberta's new cases today, 1,413. That is four straight days of flat or declining numbers, but the same period has also seen a record number of COVID deaths. Edmonton is hosting the World Junior Hockey Championship and news today that eight German players have tested positive for COVID, along with two staff from the Swedish team. So far, the games are still on. Here's Rafi Bujikanian. Team Canada won the last World Juniors in January. The challenge now to stay focused off the ice too, with 10 positive cases inside the so-called bubble. It's definitely very unfortunate for the guys that tested positive. This, despite precautions, hundreds of staff, media, players quarantined for seven days before traveling to Canada, five more days after arrival, sequestered in hotels, tested daily for COVID. But problems emerged early. Three visiting teams crammed on a plane for more than 24 hours. You know, the air wasn't very good, it was crowded. Two staff from one of those teams, Sweden, are among those who tested positive. So are eight German players. In Edmonton, a hot zone now, little sign of enthusiasm. Life goes on in a sense, but um, I don't know, it's kind of a double-edged sword. I think they should uh, cancel it for a better time. The province says there has been no transmission within the bubble. Everyone got infected before getting to Canada. Not good enough for this public health expert. Postpone your wedding. Um, forego visits with sick and dying relatives. And these are all things that Albertans have been asked to and have done. Um, and yet we have a difficult time saying no to a hockey tournament. The province's top doctor recognized she's asking a lot of Albertans. Then considering again the, the challenge of allowing or not the tournament to go ahead, uh, that was a judgment call uh, because I know that many people also uh, get joy from watching these kinds of events. For now, Sweden and Germany are both quarantined and the games will go on. Rafi Bujikani on CBC News, Edmonton. Nine months into the pandemic and the numbers are still, for many of us, startling. 75 million confirmed infections around the world. More than 1.6 million people have died. Across Latin and South America, COVID-19 has become a leading cause of death in nearly a dozen countries. In the United States, more than 313,000 have died as the caseload continues to climb daily. As of today, enough doses have been secured to inoculate the most vulnerable people across 190 countries, a global vaccination initiative that is an unprecedented medical achievement. Health reporter Christine Burak has the details. U.S. Vice President Mike Pence got his shot today. I didn't feel a thing. In the global race for vaccines, the United States went it alone, but most of the world pulled together. All 190 countries and economies participating in COVAX will be able to access vaccines to protect vulnerable groups in their populations during the first half of next year. COVAX is a global alliance offering all countries equal access to a wide range of possible vaccines. With COVID-19, no one is safe until everyone is safe. It's now secured nearly 2 billion vaccine doses over the next two years. There is hope, uh, good hope now for vaccines. It's not nearly enough, but by the end of next year, 20% of people in most countries should be vaccinated. Canada, though, has pre-bought more vaccines per capita than any other country in the world, around 10 doses per person. Some health experts have called it hoarding, but now it seems Canada is willing to give up some of its extra supply. I would like to thank Canada and Prime Minister Trudeau for committing to share surplus doses of COVID-19 vaccines. 
we're seeing individual countries uh, sort of undermining what is actually best for the world. Experts say countries like the U.S. and Canada with strong health care systems and financial resources will recover first. In the rest of the world, it will take much longer. For many people, they're hoping to get vaccinated in 2022, even 2023 or after. And so that just highlights the deep inequities of our world that will result in more deaths than are needed. To combat those inequities going forward, health experts say countries need contracts or global agreements in place before health emergencies happen to better protect all people around the world. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. And a second vaccine has now been approved in the United States. The FDA has granted emergency use authorization to Moderna. Canada is expecting 168,000 doses of it this month, though the vaccine does still need approval from Health Canada. The airline industry has been among the hardest hit by the pandemic. Even during this holiday season, travel has tanked. But as Briar Stewart explains, there are several efforts underway to help Canadians feel more comfortable about buckling in. I'm going to ask you to pull down your mask for me, please. It's another step at check-in, but completely voluntary. Oh, what's it? Yeah, that's not fun. In Vancouver, passengers flying on WestJet can take a COVID test, both a swab and a spit version. It's part of a UBC study to check their accuracy. Yeah, it's great because I'm going to see my parents and they're older, but this is just kind of like next level uh, peace of mind. While Ellie Martinez feels safe flying to Winnipeg, many usual travelers are staying home. During the holidays, Vancouver Airport would typically get 100,000 passengers a day, but this year they're expecting 10 to 15 percent of that. With the vaccine still several months away for most Canadians, the aviation industry is looking at ways to help make people feel safe about flying again. The pilot project is one of a handful taking place across the country. In Calgary, nearly 15,000 travelers from abroad have taken part in a program which allows them to have a shorter quarantine period if they test negative. In Montreal, the airport launched on-site rapid testing for those traveling to France. They need to have the negative results, so for them to, to be able to do it in kind of a one-stop shop at the airport is very convenient. This week, WestJet and Air Canada resume flights to Hawaii because Canadians can skip the quarantine there if they pay a private lab like this one to take a test ahead of time. The demand has continually grown and when we sort of ramp forward, we think we're going to be able to probably be doing about 200 a day. All of the testing is part of an attempt to figure out air travel in a COVID world. Having an advanced screen for COVID, even with a vaccine, is going to be important. I'm free. Because if airports find tests that are reliable, it could go a long way in convincing people to start traveling again. Have a good flight. Thank you. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Vancouver. For now, though, many Canadians are finding creative ways to enjoy the holidays closer to home. Outdoor winter sports are always popular, but this year, busy rinks and slopes have the extra challenge of trying to keep COVID safe. Carolyn Dunn reports from a ski hill near Calgary. The conditions at Nakiska Ski Resort are a little icy, but enthusiasm for hitting the slopes is burning hot. There's lots of great places to be outside, lots of good things to be doing. Um, we just have to be respectful to the rules That's, and be careful. And there are rules that vary from province to province. Skiing provides great joy, but it will be different this winter. If you have um, an ideological um, reason for not wearing a mask, that's, you know, that, that's up to you. Um, we ask that you don't come to the ski resort. Jackie Dijewski says all the extra measures are worth it. It keeps you mentally healthy and physically healthy, so I love it. Indoor dining is closed, so eating takeout or brown bag meals in the parking lot is the new normal. Doritos and cookies. <laughs> <laughs> good, good healthy options. There's physical distancing, including for groups waiting for the chairlift. Elliot Weinstein is taking turns with his wife, looking after five-month-old Theo and skiing. So we chose um, as quiet of a day as we could imagine and you know you know school's starting to let out in the next little couple days so we wanted to get out before that. 
There have been challenges. Big White Resort in BC is in the middle of a 76 case staff outbreak linked to staff quarters and socializing. A much smaller staff outbreak of nearly a dozen at Lake Louise was brought under control. Those cases were caught, put into isolation, and first contacts were all put into isolation um, as, a, as a precaution. Nikiska has taken similar action with its cases. The risk is low uh, for families and individuals uh, visiting any ski resort. If you stick to the rules, wear a mask and stay in your household bubble from home to the hills and back. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, Kananaskis Country, Alberta. Alongside the pandemic, Alberta is also struggling with an opioid crisis. New data shows that 2020 has been the deadliest recorded. Each one of these fatalities represent a family and a community who need support. 904 lives were lost in the first 10 months of 2020. That's more than the total in any year since tracking began four years ago. The former clerk of the B.C. legislature, Craig James, is facing criminal charges in connection with a spending scandal more than two years ago. The 69-year-old made his first court appearance today and was released on bail. We're a week into the largest immunization project in Canadian history. Up next, my interview with the man in charge of Ontario's vaccine rollout, what we've learned about the road ahead. Plus, so what exactly does this mRNA do? The Canadian YouTube stars combating vaccine fiction online. And take that, 2020. Hello, hello, ho, ho. From volunteering to sub in for Santa, to saying thanks a decade later or singing to keep our spirits up. Please. Stories of Canadians going out of their way to make a dark year merry and bright. We're back in two. Retired General Rick Hillier is once again answering the call of duty. Twelve years after he stepped down as Canada's top soldier, he's leading Ontario's mission to distribute COVID-19 vaccines to every corner of Canada's most populous province. A job requiring, according to the Premier, military precision. Hillier built a reputation for loyalty from his troops and for plainly speaking his mind. And Rick Hillier joins us now from Toronto tonight. We're five days in since the vaccination started in Ontario. What lessons have you learned so far from the rollout? Well, Ian, we've learned a lot. Number one and overwhelming to all of us is how inspirational this is. And, and, and we shouldn't minimize that, uh, that we're learning this. It's inspirational to those who are involved vaccinating others. They feel that they're part of, you know, lighting the match to light the light at the end of a long, dark tunnel. It's inspirational to those who are receiving the vaccine, who, who sense a chance to free themselves from this terrible nightmare that we've been in. And, and we're learning how, how emotional it is for all of us involved and engaged. I watched the first vaccinations from a distance, and oh my goodness, I'm just a hard, crusty old guy. I was emotional on that day. But we also learned some pragmatic things too. We learned the logistics tail of this is enormous, and we have to get it right before somebody puts a needle in somebody's arm with the vaccine. We learned the communications part of this is crucial. How we reach out to the individuals, get them to book their time for a, a vaccination shot, how we record the fact that they were there, had that shot, and how we pre-reserve a spot for them 21 days later, and, and, and all those things beside. But we learned how important this is going to be for our country. I think the emotional thing, and I don't think any of us were quite prepared for how, how impactful that would be, how important that would be, but we certainly learned it over this last few days. It is interesting because I've heard from a lot of people about uh, how they did feel emotional who were involved in this process, even as you describe yourself, a crusty old guy like you. So, so that is interesting. Uh, let's talk a little bit about one part of the logistics. Ontario is rolling this vaccine out in a different way than, for example, B.C. It's a two-dose vaccine. So as I understand it, what you're doing in Ontario is you're saying we're going to use half of the vaccines we have so we know for sure that the other half will be available in a few weeks' time. In BC, they have decided we want to push out all the vaccines we have right now and bank on the fact that we'll have enough for that second shot. Are you confident that the Ontario approach is the better one? Listen, we've had lots of discussion about our approach, and we know there are other approaches that are different. I would say both are right. Uh, you know, uh, here we're just running our own program. We're responsible, and, and, and we're going to meet that responsibility to the people of Ontario. 
But here's what I would tell you, Ian. We have not been able to nail down the times and dates and the number of doses that we'll get, when they'll arrive, and how many we would get in in Ontario with any great uh, sort of precision whatsoever. And so when we got those first doses, we decided, you know, we trust but verify. Uh, like Ronald Reagan said one time, we would give those first doses, but we would hold this, the second one in the freezer so we would not be without 21 days later. As we go through uh, this process, this vaccination process, we will gain more confidence in our supply chain, in those doses showing up regularly. We'll revisit this, and I don't have any doubt whatsoever that somewhere down the road, hopefully sooner, we'll have that confidence and change our approach and then use whatever we get to vaccinate the greatest number of people, confident that we'll have the second dose. Right now, we're gonna err on the side of caution with those small numbers that we have, and uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna save that second dose, we're gonna keep it in our sight and make sure it's there at day 21. Wasn't expecting a Ronald Reagan Cold War quote, but uh, it seems apt in the, uh, in the context. Rick Hillier, thank you very much. Ian, my pleasure, thank you. When we come back, combating myths and falsehoods about the vaccines in places where misinformation thrives. Just because it's safe doesn't mean there won't be any soreness or pain. How influencers and platforms are tackling conspiracy theories that spread like wildfire on social media. Plus... When you think buy local, you don't think buy black local. People just think buy local. The effort to change that just ahead on The National. One of the first doses of the Pfizer vaccine administered in Ontario wasn't perfect. Liquid is seen leaking out of the recipient's arm. The hospital said the nurse offered a redose, standard practice. The recipient felt she didn't need it. Experts say what happened was a common syringe mishap. Likely the needle wasn't screwed to the vial tightly enough, but the image prompted some conspiracy theories online. That kind of thinking thrives during times of anxiety, especially where health is concerned, and misinformation can spread online as fast or faster than the physical disease. So, Joanna Emiliotis asks the question, who is fighting it? How do you want to set up reading this script? When it comes to setting up a conversation yeah. about science, Mitchell Moffat no and Greg way. Brown are pros. What are we talking about today? Talking about vaccines. Yeah. The Toronto-based duo behind ASAP um, Science take on stuff people are talking about. Go for and it. Right now, this is it. So how do they make this vaccine so fast when often historically it's taken a decade or two decades? With 10 million subscribers on YouTube well, alone, their influence is undeniable. So is it safe is the big question tons of people are asking. Ultimately, so far, yes. That and in this pandemic, so they is their power to shape a high-stakes message serious. around the new COVID DNA. vaccines. There's a lot of misinformation online that is going to change your DNA, but that's completely false. This mRNA never goes into your nucleus, and it doesn't last very long in your body. MRNA There's definitely some wild conspiracy theories. Not even that they're necessarily worth sharing, but just like the kind of extreme things that this is like you know, microchipped and brain control. And so you see anything. I think that's the frustrating part about misinformation is that anyone can say anything. But misinformation and conspiracy theories are always going to be more, quote unquote, sexy or interesting than science. Science is nuanced. But when this pandemic hit, it was just like very clear to us what we needed to do, what we wanted to do. We wanted to explain how they work and what happens to your As body science communicators, and Brown and Moffitt use fact to combat fiction and to address understandable questions. So what exactly does this end? RNA do. It's a great chance to just put that out there in a package that people are wanting to listen to. And I guess that's kind of encouraging that lots of people are at least searching, looking for answers. And so the more likely they are to find the right answers. And I think that is really a responsibility of these big media corporations like YouTube, like Facebook. To help people find the right answers, Google, TikTok and Twitter recently announced tighter policies around vaccine misinformation. Facebook also released its plan. We've actually removed 12 million pieces of individual misinformation content that's harmful in nature. Kevin Chan is global director of public policy at Facebook Canada. From his home office in Ottawa, he says the pandemic strategy has been about removing and redirecting. Through our partnerships with public health uh, experts, like the Public Health Agency of Canada, uh, we've actually uh, run pop-up notifications to drive traffic to the official website of uh, the Public Health Agency of Canada. And there, we, we think that we've reached 
millions of Canadians and globally we've reached over 2 billion people uh, in this way. Uh, if you search and you type in vaccine and COVID-19. Searches lead to a COVID resource page that includes a section on vaccines. The new rules also dictate what people can say about them. Can you give us a sense of when you're taking away that disinformation or harmful misinformation, have you seen anything specific to the vaccine that you've removed? If it's about its safety, its efficacy, the ingredients, um, we will remove those things from Facebook. If there are conspiracies about the origins uh, of this vaccine, we will remove that as well. I think it's important to note that people will have their own questions about the vaccine and they are legitimate questions. And so we do want to preserve the space for people to be able to express individual thoughts, individual um, anecdotes about their experiences. It's a tough balance and getting it right is critical. People who get most of their information from social media are more likely to be hesitant about getting vaccinated. The concern is a barrage of misleading content could harden that hesitancy, posing a risk to herd immunity and to the way out of this pandemic. We are tracking misinformation every day. Uh, we are taking action against misinformation every day. Michelle Austin is the head of public policy at Twitter Canada based in Ottawa. Starting next week, she says Twitter will also track and remove misleading posts specifically about vaccines and keep pointing users to trusted sources like the Public Health Agency of Canada. Safety is our number one priority. But, she says, it will sure hold back when it's clear people are looking for answers. So context is really important. If it's very clear to us that it's malicious or factually wrong, then it'll be taken down. But a lot of people are coming to Twitter to find out more about the vaccine, and that is extremely important. It is part of a broader soft sell. From public health officials to politicians, the strategy is to partner with platforms and the influencers on them. Federal NDP leader Jagmeet Singh and musician Johnny Orlando joined forces to create a TikTok promoting safe pandemic choices. I think it's very With Orlando's nearly 10 million followers, it's a surefire way to reach the masses. This is a very weird year, uh, and it's a year where a lot of misinformation, a lot of crazy things happening. So um, I feel like it's it's kind of a waste of a platform if I can't use it to help inspire and, and keep people healthy. Social media has been a great tool to connect, particularly now when we've been really isolated more than ever. And while this TikTok doesn't have to do with vaccines, Singh says that one is coming. Absolutely. I'm planning on, on getting vaccinated very, very publicly and sharing that with people. Nice. <laughs> there is this enormous opportunity that you can reach a huge population very quickly with well-crafted viral messaging, and that can be very powerful. And, and Angus Bridgman is a researcher at the Media Ecosystem Observatory in Montreal. He says people tend to follow people who think like them. So while social media's reach is enormous, it is limited to. So when a creator comes out with a piece of content and shares it to their followers, it's already likely that that group of followers already is going to maybe believe that message or agree with them already. And so they might not be able to move the needle very much. And the communities that are not following them, that maybe need that messaging more, they won't get it. Bridgman says more could be done to reach vaccine-hesitant people if the government moves in to regulate social media platforms and the misinformation on them. Especially during a pandemic when face-to-face -face contact is limited, these online spaces happen to be the primary forms of conversation about an issue. And so now they're, they're coming up and saying, oh yeah, we're going to do all these things. Well, okay, but where, where is the democratic oversight of that? You know, I think many have been sounding this alarm for many years, but it, it is uniquely important right now during this time of COVID-19 when these misperceptions have real life or death consequences. I think we need to calm down because we're not, we still have months before we actually get these vaccines. And I think it will be a time, while before most Canadians get vaccinated. Time, time say Moffitt and Brown, for science to keep making its case. It's just going to be time passing. It's just going to show even more efficacy, even more safety that I would honestly say, let's not get too riled up and start fighting right now. 
let's just relax and be like let's let let's let this play out because it will be fine. We all want to protect ourselves. We all want to protect our families, our kids. And so I think to simply educate people is like really powerful. <laughs> Thank you all so much for watching. I hope this video was helpful for understanding the virus and the vaccine. And make sure to subscribe for more science. And the hope is, when it comes to vaccines, right. the facts yeah. will win the day. Okay. That's good. Tear yeah. down. <laughs> Joanna Rumeliotis, CBC News, yeah, Toronto. Still ahead on The National, addressing inequity and figuring out a fix. There's enough stress as it is, as a black business owner, let alone now with COVID. The online shopping mall for black entrepreneurs and... It is actually a really good business model to be diverse and inclusive. Old stories, new leads, writing leading roles for LGBTQ characters in Christmas movies. Like everything else this year, holiday shopping is a lot different. In many parts of Canada, the decorations may be up, but the only browsing is through a window. And the only lineup is a pickup at curbside. Some black business owners say the pandemic has been especially hard for them. And while the federal government has promised help, the Ebony Shopping Plaza aims to stimulate the black economy now. Kayla Hounsell takes a look at a very focused online mall. Like so many, this couple found themselves looking for ways to earn a living during the pandemic. That really made us just shoot for it and push to do what we wanted to do on our own because we were just tired of working for other people. We wanted to do our own thing. They decided to make and sell hot chocolate bombs, delicate molds with the ingredients inside. Everybody loves chocolate, why not? They started by promoting their products on Facebook, but now they found a new connection for their confection. So when you think buy local, you don't think buy black local, people just think buy local. Jessica Bowden is hoping to change that. The Ebony Shopping Plaza she created now has nearly 40 black businesses showcasing their products in one place. There's enough stress as it is as a black business owner trying to figure out where you fit into the market, let alone now with COVID, you know, you're hearing, oh, there's all kinds of funding for you, but where's it at? The federal government has created specific programs to help black businesses, but many say the money isn't yet flowing. So it was critical for us to hear from those from those businesses. Colin Lynch just wrapped up discussions with black business owners across the country. He says the pandemic is exacerbating issues the community was already facing. Many black business owners have not had uh, the access to, whether it's family and friends financing and the networks that business owners really rely on to be able to backstop um, in times like the ones we're living through right now. Marshmallows. These new entrepreneurs say they're grateful to be a part of the Ebony Shopping Plaza. And I feel like we don't get that many opportunities to do that, to just put our businesses out there and get everyone to see them. They say right now business is booming. And that's pretty sweet. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Halifax. There we go. Am I hungry now? Absolutely. When we come back, writing lead romance roles for LGBTQ characters. What was also missing was sort of this classic, tropey, fabulous, happy love story. Why this year's slate of Christmas movies is important to so many. But first, we've been bringing you stories of Canadians doing amazing things to bring a little light to the end of a dark year. We call it Take That 2020. Here's the story of what happened when a respirologist heard singing coming from the stairwell in his hospital. I like to sing in the stairwell here at the hospital and because the acoustics are amazing. And I was just singing away and I basically got busted singing by Alan. <laughs> So he came up with this idea because it's Christmas time. So he's like, why don't we do a, a video, like a, a Christmas song? <laughs> Having this like Christmas song and coming together the way we did, it just helped bring people together and bring them some kind of happiness and positivity, at least a little bit of their day.
Welcome back. This year's array of holiday films includes something new, an unprecedented wave centered around LGBTQ relationships. Some say it's about time, others say there's still a long way to go. Here's Eli Glasner. For many, December means a certain kind of cinematic comfort food. But there's been a group left out of those traditional tales of cheer. As you realize your sexuality growing up, and you kind of think, oh, you know, am I bisexual? Am I gay? Am I a lesbian? I don't see myself represented. It kind of just makes you feel sad. But in 2020, there's a whole sleigh full of queer content. From Happiest Season... <laughs> are you doing in the closet? To dashing in December. Oh, hey. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll use the one down the hall. And I hate New Year's. Feels good, doesn't it? Being in love. This director says while there's plenty of gay and lesbian movies, most are rather serious. They're coming out stories, they're unrequited love, and some people still experience that. But I think what was also missing was sort of this classic, tropey, fabulous, happy, Love story. Do you? Think Last year, the Hallmark Channel buckled under pressure and removed a TV commercial featuring a same sex wedding. And from when we celebrate Christmas with our kids. Now they're making their own gay holiday film. Because it's been proven time and time again that it is actually a really good business model to be diverse and inclusive, they're realizing that the real risk is leaving communities out. Hi. I hope this isn't too over the top. And so after years of playing minor gay characters, Toronto's Ben Lewis is co-starring with his real-life husband in the Christmas setup. A big deal for Ben, and even the guy giving him his pre-production COVID test. He was very emotional, just sort of like, as he's like swabbing our noses, um, telling us, uh, you know, how much the representation um, means to him, how it's something he never thought he would see. While Lewis is thrilled to be playing a character with enough screen time to merit the classic on-screen kiss, he says more needs to be done to include trans and people of color so everyone gets their mistletoe moment. Eli Glaster, CBC News, Toronto. Next on The National, a meaningful moment of thanks 10 years later. I owe them a lot. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I really wanted to see them and yeah, say thank you reaching out to the paramedics who saved her life. But first... Hello, hello, ho, ho. A band of Santa's helpers is spreading some much needed cheer by paying socially distanced visits to Winnipeg families. It all stemmed from one of my good friends and wanted me to uh, come to their house and dress up like Santa and make their children's COVID Christmas a lot better. And I, I thought, well, why stop there? Seven traveling Santas are now making the rounds, all while collecting food donations for charity. What started out as a gesture has turned into more than 600 scheduled visits. You know, to spread that joy amongst our city is uh, it's a big pleasure. And to see the kids' smiles and faces, it, uh, it really is uplifting. Ten years ago, Chloe Rabi Roussel went into cardiac arrest while she was brushing her teeth. The paramedics came and they saved her life. Now, a decade later, Chloe wanted to thank them. A month ago, she wrote her heroes a letter asking if they could meet in person and their reunion is our moment. I wanted to say thank you to the paramedics here um, because it did something amazing for me 10 years ago. I did a cardiac arrest uh, when I was at home and they shocked me and it, uh, it saved me, so I owe them a lot. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Oh, it's so um, nice to meet you. Yeah, it's really nice. Thank you, thank you so much for coming today. When we look at this letter and we read it, we remember that call like it was, uh, it was yesterday. When I received the, the letter, it was a very uh, emotive moment for us. Today, when we see her, that makes sense to us to do that job, to do it every day. One of us rode in with you, I can't remember I think it was exactly. you. Something like this happens and you know somebody's going to go on to live a full life. It validates our work. Yeah. <laughs> they brought me back to life, but they also uh, helped. A bit of an emotional uh, 
thing to see them. I mean, I don't have any memories of them because I, I was not conscious when it happened, but to know that I owe it to them, it's, a, it's very special. <laughs> Saving a life and saving, uh, you know, a family as well. She's now married. She has two kids. And uh, one of the things that the paramedics say is that uh, one of them at least remembers the call very well because they were running up three flights of stairs to save her. And you just wonder, I bet you there are a lot of first responders across the country watching this, thinking of cases they've dealt with in the past for that fleeting moment and wondering for a long time after how things worked out. That is the National for December the 18th. I hope you can join me Sunday afternoon for Cross Country Checkup on CBC Radio 1. And then later that evening back here on the National. Have a great weekend.